Kenya happened almost by accident, really. My father was an engineer and we lived in Calcutta for a few years when I was a teenager. And I used to go hang out with the elephants in the zoo. And when they were sitting there swaying back and forth, and I just felt really sorry for them. And I always sort of made a secret promise to myself that one day I'd help them. Well, I came back to Ann Arbor to go to university. My parents both got quite ill and ended up dying over time. And I took care of them and I sort of dropped out of school and worked in a restaurant for 16, 17 years. My sister and I were going to take this big trip anyway because she had some money, which I didn't really have at the time at all. And I said, hey, let's go to Africa. I got to Kenya and the next day went out in the bush and was surrounded by wild elephants and tears just poured down my face and I just felt, oh my God, this is where I'm supposed to be. I think growing up in a third world country and, and there's just, it's just a different attitude about life. Things are simpler and that suits me better. I moved to Kenya on September 7th of 2001. So I was still moving into my house when September 11th happened. I didn't know where to go when I first got there, but I knew that I wanted to do the work. I wanted to help. I've been really lucky. I've gotten a lot of really good compliments lately about how much we've accomplished in a short time, which is really cool. Amara means urgent need in Swahili. And I thought it's a pretty word. But urgent need is, is what we're trying to address. I think the time is viewed differently in African countries. Our sense of time in the West is very specific and we've got meetings and we do this, 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 and our days are planned out and everything happens. Nothing happens like that in Africa. There's no time in Africa, really. Most people don't know their birthdays. They don't know what day they were born. They don't often know what year. They guess how old they are. But then what I can do directly myself is do education work, environmental education work in rural areas, because in Kenya there isn't any offered in the schools anywhere, really. People were nomadic or semi-nomadic for quite a while and they moved around with the rains and the water and so on. <laughs> so they're finding there's sort of competition between the people and the, and the wildlife that maybe may have been there before. Although they've lived there for generations, they regard wildlife as kind of a threat, obviously, which is understandable. The lion can hurt them, a hyena could attack their child, an elephant could raid their farm. So they just avoid them. And they don't understand. They often don't know what these animals eat, what their lifestyles are, how they actually function, and how they can easily coexist with them if they need to, because they didn't have to before. Usually from where I am, just outside Nairobi, where my base is, I'll have to go up, you know, between four and six, seven hours to get to where I'm going to start from working in, the rural, in a rural area. Usually I'll go out in the bush 
and plan to be out for two weeks or so, two to four weeks. So for a few days before I have to plan and pack food and pack all the safari gear, pack the, all the film equipment in the car and the generator and extra petrol and everything to survive because you never know if your car is going to break down somewhere and you might have to spend a few days out in the middle of nowhere and you have, to, you have everything with you wherever you go to be okay. Universally, which I wasn't really sure about until I saw it, they're always thrilled, they're always excited. They'll sit and wait all day for me to show up, and they'll be just running and jumping and screaming when I get there. They all want to see it. Film is a really great medium for people who are quite often semi or, or mostly illiterate, for one thing. And it's also very immediate impact, you know, it's there, they just sit there, they watch it. Wow. And the older people, especially in the really rural areas, all of them, they're just wide-eyed and amazed. And I've had people afterwards say, you know, how did you get the elephant on the wall? Okay. Afterwards, some of these people I've had old men ask me, how many toes does an elephant have? Do tusks fall off? Well, no, they don't. You know, they don't know a lot of the basic things, and they're fascinated, and they want to know. But they, their lifestyles are also such that you know, poor people have to work really hard and spend a lot of their living hours just getting food and getting water. A lot of people walk 15, 20 kilometers just to get water to cook with. And they haven't had time to sit and think about these things. Right now we've got one film unit that we have out working, which I run and I do myself. I would like to have five film units run up and running year-round in Kenya, because then we could get all the films to everybody, everywhere. That's a goal that we have. If they understand why they have to keep their environment precious and how they're responsible for it, then they will all be more receptive to the idea of working against poaching themselves and keeping their whole environment intact. I was initially interested in primarily in just working against, directly against poaching and helping people who were getting poachers. There are basically two kinds of poaching. There's, there's bushmeat poaching or snaring. And then there's elephant and rhino poaching. We always work with local groups, local conservation groups, primarily desnaring teams and things that we've already been had some support with, who are already working in areas against poaching and have community involvement. It's not subsistence snaring. It's not a, a guy out feeding his family. In which case, it, that would that would be sustainable. You know, one or two antelope a month would feed a family or something like that. But what it is is commercial groups. It's guys going out getting 20, 30, 40 antelope a night if they can. It's commercial, it's, it's greed. I've seen elephants missing half their trunks because they'll just get their trunk caught in there. And they'll pull out. I've seen elephant babies whose mothers, babies will get caught in a snare and the mother will just go crazy trying to pull it out and break its leg, break its shoulder. Huh? 
<laughs> the um, desnaring team that we support um, and along with the Kenya Wildlife Service were chasing elephants that were raiding farms around Savo National Park. From the chopper they saw this little tiny skinny elephant that couldn't keep up, it was sort of wobbling along. He had a snare around his neck that went around over his ear and back in front of his head. And they just threw him down on the ground and cut, his, cut the snare off. We thought he was going to lose his ear because the snare was so tight against it. Amara paid the money for his, his care for the first six months. And uh, they're bottle fed and there's a lot involved there. Twenty have keep it with him twenty four hours a day. He really struggled, but he's a really game little guy. He's just within a week or two he was playing with the other elephants. But he's fine. I mean he's a great elephant. He's got little tusks now. I just saw him last month. And he's he's just thriving. Elephants live, people may not all know this, but they live the same, their lifestyle, their lives progress very similarly to humans. A two-year-old elephant is like a two-year-old baby human. It can't survive without its mother. It has to be underneath its mother during the day or it gets sun, horrible sunburn, which will, can, can actually kill it. And an eight-year-old elephant is like an eight-year-old human, kind of having fun and playing around, but doesn't know what to do with itself. Well, they take these elephants and they keep them in the Nairobi orphanage while they're milk dependent for the first two years or so, and then they take them down to the to Savo National Park where they have two release sites now, where they walk out in the bush each day with their keepers and come back at night, and eventually as they get older and it's time for them to go, they rejoin wild herds. As long as there's any market for ivory, there will be poaching. <laughs>